Reggie happens to be here tonight. So Reggie, can you just stand up real quick? Reggie, there he is right here. <laughs> Love having you here tonight, man. <laughs> All right. you, you look good in that snapback too. I like that. It's good. Um, well, tonight, Woodside, it's already been so great just to sing songs unto the Lord and to lift his name up on high. And, you know, tonight we want to talk a little bit about this thing called worship. Um, if you've grown up in church for any time at all, you know that sometimes the worship is the thing that can be talked about and argued about and debated about the most. And, um, and so tonight we thought, let's just pull back the curtain a little bit and let's just talk about what it is we're doing. Because when you think about it, a bunch of people gathering together into one space and we're singing songs together. Who does that, right? That's just kind of weird. And we're singing songs and, and you guys are looking this way and we happen to be looking this way and it's just like, what is this thing? Well, I'm so thankful tonight that when we talk about the subject of worship, worship obviously isn't just singing. It isn't just music. It's not us performing uh, songs. Worship really is one word, response. And that's why we ended up with the title on this album that we're about ready to release after tonight with the word response. And, and to take it even a step further, all of Christianity is but a response. All of our lives are a response to the grace that God has given to us. Anything outside of response would be our attempt to appease a holy God. I hope you understand this tonight. There's a difference between what religions are and what the Bible tells us God's after. In the Bible, when I read my Bible, I open up Genesis and I read about God creating mankind. It seems to be that God creates us for the purposes of fellowship and communion with one another. I've read Genesis over and over, and I'm waiting to find the place where it says, he invented this religion, sign up for this religion, join this class, and then you sign up, pray this, and then you enter into the correct religion. Sign the box, you're good. It's not there. And so it would seem to me, if God in the beginning created us with the purpose of enjoying fellowship with him, that chances are that would be the exact same purpose he has for you and me. And that's why if you've grown up in the church for any time at all, we don't talk a lot about religion as much as we talk about having a what? Relationship. Having a relationship with God. And that might seem like such a foreign thought to some of you tonight. But let's just for a second get a little logical. Because if you're like me, I'm very... I don't want to sign up for religion that makes a really bad hobby. I want to figure it out. What's true and what's not? And so what I've, what I've discovered is that basically man-made religion ideas are our attempt to appease this holy deity in the sky. Our attempts to appease God. If I do this and don't do this and pray this and go to this place and don't do that and you start going down the checklist of what to do, what not to do. If I do it and I'm a good enough boy or girl, then somehow that holy deity will be like, job well done, bro. Good job. You did it. Come on in. And to me as a logical human being, when I read the word of God, and he describes as God as being holy, 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 then the problem is I don't think I'll ever be good enough to impress a holy God. So this idea that I can do something to gain salvation never made sense to me until I heard about Christianity. And by the way, if you were a God and you were inventing a religion for mankind, wouldn't you invent a religion where you end up with all the glory? Do you know that Christianity is the religion where God gets all the glory and you and I get none? The Bible says salvation belongs to the Lord. And some of you are like, well, I'm not cool with that because I'm like a good person. I go to church on Sunday, bro. Well, so do I. A lot. In fact, they pay me to come to church. It's, it's kind of a good gig. 
<laughs> but we'll never be good enough, right? It just logically doesn't make sense. Really? Really? You're going to stand in front of a holy, holy God and talk about what, how good you are. No. And so tonight, congratulations. There's hope for you. Here's why. We don't believe in fairy tales and we don't believe in what atheists might think. We just throw our intellect out the door. No way. Our faith is rooted in a historical event tonight, people. 2,000 plus years ago, hold on, 2,000 plus years ago, I don't want anyone to miss this. This is called good news. Here's the news. God was holy, and he didn't just go, I'm holy, they're sinners, they're condemned, they're going to a place called H-E double hockey stick. I'm Canadian, I always use that term. Reminds me of being home. I don't know why we laugh. We're talking about hell. We should not have done that. I'm sorry. It's a real place. So here's the thing. God didn't just say, okay, I'm holy. They're condemned. No good. The Bible says God so loved the world. Take away world and put your name in there. The so is emphatic in the Greek. You don't put so in there if there's no so in the Greek. God was obsessive in his love wanting you back so much so that he became a man this is why Christmas blows me away because think about the whole story it couldn't get any more glorious God becomes a man there's no room for him in an inn which demonstrates his complete humility because if you've ever studied the cosmos and you realize how big this place is you're like what there's no room for son of God not even in a in? Are you kidding me? And it's like, of course there's no room. He's so humble. He's so glorious. This is amazing. And he comes and he lives a life that you and I couldn't live. We've tried it. You failed. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And then what happens? We stand with shame and guilt. But Jesus, the Bible says Jesus went to the cross and the reason he died on the cross wasn't just to demonstrate love and it wasn't just to give you a good life and a better marriage. No, Jesus had to die. Why does he have to die? Jesus had to die because it's either him or you. The Bible says there's no remission of sin except the shedding of blood, and Jesus was the perfect lamb of, lamb of God. He was the sacrifice, the atonement. He is in your place. That's why to this day you see Christians and Catholics wearing crosses. The reason we do that, some Catholics might mark themselves with the cross, it's we, we remind ourselves of the cross all the time because it's in the cross. It's just where we get our salvation and our hope. And there's no one like Jesus. I wish that there was a million roads to the same place. But there's no one like him. There's no sufficient savior. There's no one who's atoned for your sin tonight except Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he paid it in full to tell us die. When Jesus says it is finished, he meant it. No shame, no guilt for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so I love it because my faith tonight isn't based in a hope, so it's based in history that Jesus truly did come and live. He did die. And three days later, he was seen by his disciples and 500 plus other people. And to this day, history doesn't give a better account than he must have physically rose from the grave. You could study it all. But here's the thing. Some of us in the church, you're like, yeah, 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 I know that. I know that already. That's why I'm here tonight. All of life is but a response to the greatest gift of all, the grace of God in your life. What does your response to this gift look like? Because what I believe is the most powerful tool that we have in 2015 to reach the world with this message lies in how we respond to this news. If our response is not convincing, what, why do you think they're not in church? When I study the scripture and I look at men and women who encountered the living God, I think about David. Remember David encounters the living God. And David, he's, his Bible says that he danced before the Lord. He danced before the Lord. You know what that tells me? Worship should be exciting. Worship should be exhilarating. Our worship should cause us to be 
and to get caught up in something that otherwise we wouldn't be. How many people, when, when the Lions are on and you, they get a touchdown and you're like, that is totally the grace of God that there's a touchdown from the Lions. You get geeked up. You get excited. You should get excited. I get excited. I'm not even a Detroiter. But we don't have any teams in Canada. We have the CFL and nobody watches that. I'm a little bitter. But David's response when he encounters the living God is this. I gotta dance, I gotta move, I, I, I gotta sing unto the Lord. But if that was it, that would be incomplete. Think about Moses' response when he encounters the living God. The living God says to Moses, Moses, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. You know what that tells me about worship? Worship should be reverent. There should be an element of reverence in our worship. This isn't God our best bro. This is God of heaven and earth. Holy, 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 oh my goodness. That's the response that we should have in reverence. Then you look at a person like Isaiah. Isaiah, when he encounters the living God, he says, woe be to me. Woe be to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the Lord. And you see immediate humility. Humility. So tonight I want you to think about that. If in the Bible, when they encounter the Lord, we see excitement, celebration, reverence, and awe, We see humility. What does our worship look like when we come to a church building on Sunday morning? Does it characterize what true worship looks like? Is there reverence? Is there humility? Is there celebration and joy? You know, as a worship leader, I have the opportunity every weekend to stand right here and look out at you guys. And I tell you what, that some of the godliest men I know, they, they worship God like this. All to Jesus I surrender. That's how they look, and it's like, that is okay. Because in their hearts, they're bursting, but they've just never told their body how to move. <laughs> and that's okay. Because I have a feeling tonight, and you know this to be true, the Bible even says God... Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the what? H-E-A-R-T, the heart. He looks at the heart. He sees your heart. Tonight, I'm just challenging us, guys, let's be a church that responds in worship with the type of characteristics that I'm reading about in the Bible. I don't see la-di-da, worship you, Christ alone, cornerstone. I hope that this is over. I've got a lunch appointment. They're going five minutes over. Ah, uh, that girl's cute over there. No. <laughs> We're way off if that's our approach to worship. But we all need to grow in our worship, don't we? We all need to grow. We need to grow in celebration. We need to grow in reverence. Do you understand who you're worshiping? Man, I think the powerful tool we have, there's people here tonight, by the way, that I know that have never, ever been to a church before. There's people here tonight that don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ here tonight. They are watching you and going, is that how glorious your God is? Hmm. I think what could be so convincing for the world one of the best apologetics is a bunch of people fired up, passionate about the good news that they truly believe that their sins are gone, their shame is gone, their guilt is gone, heaven is theirs, hell is not, and they are eternally spending eternity with the Father. I think when we get fired up about that, the world might start listening. I Man, I used to think a lot about myself being a worship leader and go, uh, you know, I sing songs, I play guitar, that's kind of cool. I was at Moody Bible Institute, which is school. I want to ask the band to come out. And I want to just share this last story, and then we're going to continue to sing tonight. I was at Moody Bible Institute, and I was the band director for chapels. It's kind of a weird school. They make the students go to church like three times a week. So 
I was in this chapel, just a regular chapel, and they had this guest speaker come in. It was interesting because Moody's kind of this like, you know, you know, kind of wear suits and you look good and all that. And I understand that. And it's, a, it's a good place. But this guy walks in and he must have been 30 years old. And he's in this white t-shirt and like light jeans. And we know if you wear light jeans, it's not that big of an event because if you wear dark wash, it's an important event. So it was like, why is he wearing light jeans? You learned something tonight. Congratulations. That was free. All right. So he comes in and he stands up to the stage and all of us students are like, who's this guy, who's this guy? And I'm done leading the worship set and I go sit down. He begins to talk. And I don't remember everything he said, but this moment changed my life. It changed how I thought about myself. He was a week off the mission field in, in Libya. And he came and he was invited to speak because he was a graduate of Moody. And he got up to speak and he said, Moody students, I've heard it all before. I've heard about your passion. I've heard about how fired up you are about the things of God. That's all good and dandy. But real Christianity is real surrender. That's it. That's all it is. It's real surrender. And he said, you do not know what real surrender is until you graduate from Moody and you get on an airplane and you go over to Libya and you're serving at an orphanage. And it's your day off and your wife is going to work. And you get a phone call that says, come down to the orphanage now. There's been a problem. And you go down to the orphanage and you see yellow flags all around the building. And police saying, you can't go in there. He went on to describe the scene. That just weeks ago, he'd seen his bride be murdered and slain by somebody that did not like Christians being there. And she died what the church we call a martyr's death. And he said this, you do not know what real surrender is until you're flying home from the mission field and your wife isn't sitting next to you. She's sitting dead in the cargo bin behind you. That's what real Christianity is. whole room was just like this. What do you say to that? And I remember thinking, well, I'm a worship leader. I sing songs. God, I sing songs for you. How about that? The humility of that story. I'm realizing tonight Worship is not just about singing songs to the Lord, although that is worship, and the Bible values that intensely. Worship is a complete life of responding to good news, not to religion, but to news, news that grace is yours. Congratulations, grace is yours, and you didn't earn it. In Acts 16, 25, just real quick as we wrap up. First, 25 says about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God these guys are in prison and the prisoners were listening to them and the prisoners were listening to them people are watching you people are watching the Christians in 2015 and going do they have anything that I'm missing out on what do the Christians get fired up about how come it's the exact same things I'm fired up about they were listening to them. They couldn't believe. Here they are in prison, and they're crying out these hymns to the Lord. It says that a great earthquake came, shook the foundations of the prison, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfast. And sometimes the most, the most glorious praise is in the midst of our deepest tragedy, our deepest problem. 
tonight you're like, John, I just don't feel like worshiping. I just, I don't even know why I'm here tonight. I, 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 ever, I hear everybody around me singing. It's, I'm just not feeling it tonight. I'm just not feeling it. Congratulations. Not everyone feels everything. Tonight, it's not about feeling. It's the belief that Christ alone is the cornerstone. He will make the weak strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, even the worst of storms, he's still Lord on the throne. He's Lord of all. I surrender all. So tonight, I want to invite you to just, where you're at, sing that song to the Lord. A song of surrender saying, God, I'm responding to you. I'm responding to this grace. I'm responding in faith right now. I want to say, I surrender.
My name is Lydia.